Alright lads, welcome back to Hearts of Iron 4 and the new Order mod as Vyatka, the Tsar's realm. For our very first episode, very first full episode. Now, uh, we'll put Popper on to 5 speed. Austin Mills has informed me that the Brave New World mod does indeed work, um, despite the whole it getting deleted thing. Um, which is odd, I, I honestly thought it would be gone off the Steam store, but I, I haven't... Um, uh, I have not installed, though I have un installed the, the tool packed, uh, the tool pack, tool, tool, tool pack, tool packed, tool pack mod on his advice. I believe it's the exact same as regular. Yep, it's the exact same one as regular. Very nice. Same as, same as usual. It appears to be. <coughs> oh, <clears throat> my bad. Mm hmm, that actually kind of opens up interesting possibilities. Ooh, we could do something interesting with that. Create a unified white front, you know? When Cheetah's about to, to annex Amur, annex Amur into Cheetah. When, Magda, when Cheetah's about to knock out Magda, annex Magda into Cheetah, have a unified white army in the east. We do the same to the Samarans. Samarans. Hmm, that could be interesting. That could be interesting indeed. But alrighty. Rolling on. Return of the Emperor, political power plus 25. <clears throat> Wait. Okay, no, never mind. I'm not going to read that because we read that in the previous episode. Political power plus 25. That's fine. Um, that's a national spirit, I believe it is. It's one of those. Yeah, it is one of those things. So who's this? Oh. Ooh. Let's read it. We're, yeah, we're gonna get an event soon, so there's no, no, no real point. <clears throat> ah, yes, of course, we must uh, adjust the expenditures. Let us do so now. Holy sugar, we're actually in a surplus. I'm shocked. First of all, I'll pay some of the debt. And we all somehow have liquid reserves. Okay. I was going to say, <laughs> where are our events? There we are. We also have over 2 million people, which is fantastic. The reformer Roman Barsovich Gule was once again on the streets of Vyatka, campaigning with his followers for democracy and minority rights and ignoring the ever-present danger of German bomber raids. Marching towards the city centre, he made sure that all, those who, uh, that all those who saw him knew that fundamentally he was calling for equality within the principality. As his march continued, he was heartened by the many citizens who expressed their support and admiration for his efforts. Directly or otherwise, he hoped that one day Tsar Vladimir would say the same. Okay. I'm gonna keep it real with you, Chief. Ain't no, ain't no sizable amount of Russians arguing for minority rights in 1962 in a world where the Overton window has shifted massively to the right. I'm gonna keep it 100 with you. Okay. Now, uh, the, though he did not expect that it would come soon, for Roman he had supported the agenda of reform ever since the establishment of the Principality after the West Russian conflict, leading these marches and calling these reforms had become second nature. Indeed, even if he did not believe his actions to be groundbreaking, knew that if he could just earn the favor of the Tsar, wait, I didn't do that thing, did I? Never mind, never mind. That was in a... Uh, he knew that if he could just earn the favour of the Tsar and his ministers, real change could be brought to Vyatka. The shadow of authoritarianism would be dispelled by the light of democracy, and through the establishment of a constitutional monarchy, Russia could honour its past while at the same time marching towards its future. We will be establishing democracy in this run. Democracy is power to the people, and never before will the Russian people be so powerful as under Alexander Solzhenitsyn's government. Hmm. Holding out, eh? All right, yeah, I forgot about that. I mean, <clears throat> the thing about Tumen is, I'm fairly certain is that, obviously you have to do all of this tree, you know, you have to get here. But as soon as you get to here and finish this, you can go straight onto this tree. You don't have to do any of this. Which means you can unify incredibly early, but at the same time, like, eventually you're, you're, like, you're going to be very much short on focuses. So, I mean, why wouldn't you do this, you know what I mean? It's kind of weird. I guess... It, I guess for the societal developments, I guess, but yeah, on the same token, then you're you're missing all the, these are all 35 days, aren't they? Oh, the, yeah, 30 days, I remember that, they take a while. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, for me, I've always went, the 
the clock breaks, rebuilding a nation, rebuilding the factories. Whoever rebuilds the communes over rebuilding the factories is just weird. Okay, because then you're getting shit like white soldiers, which is just incel dumb. Well. Yeah, it is. Rebuilding an army. Yeah, I, I always went. I used to go with the red armor, but then it was ever since you had to start like modifying tanks. And to be fair, I haven't done. I, I think I've done one human run. I, I didn't even build tanks anyway because I had some slav right there next to me. So, yeah, that was pretty handy. So where the hell are my production units? What's going on here? Where are they at? What's going on? I have the production units, I have the grid power. What's the crack? What is there? Is this, is this terror bombing stuff? I think it might be. Lack of resources? We'll go fucking buy some then. So I'm gonna save this, uh, save this physical power for uh, reconnect Soviet power grids. We desperately need power. It's free civilian fact, but I. Oh, I'm a clown. Oh, I'm a clown. I'm a clown. For some reason, I thought the military factories were up there. That's my bad. I was gonna say, what the hell was going on? Well, that's, that should do it. There we are. Bloody hell. The firebrand. What is up with Soldier and port? Now, don't get me wrong. I don't think it's a bad portrait. I'm very much glad he doesn't have that fucking beard. But look at his face. It's like it's like he's about to ask a question, but like he doesn't want to interrupt you, or like he knows it's bad news, so he's like worried. Like he looks very apprehensive. It kind of reminds me. Uh, like, do you ever see the meme? It's like where like uh, it's the guy texting his landlord, and it's like our pets allowed in the house, and the landlord and the landlord replies no. And then the guy sends a picture of the pet, and the landlord goes, the landlord is like, okay, I'll allow it because he seems very polite. Like, Soldier and looks like he could be the pet. Like, he looks very polite, you know? The Firebrand. Trying to buy Confederates with, within the National Union of Solidaris. Okay, it is the National Union of Solidaris. I went with the National Lines of Russian Solidaris in the, in the description. I'll have to alter that. Um, in that case, yeah, give me, give me loot things that we do have. Oh, but no, I should, I should have saved. But, yeah, because yeah, we have 10 production units. <laughs> We're going to have a lot of equipment. We're also probably going to run broke. Which isn't great. Mm -hmm. That's fine. Uh, it was nevertheless clear to any observer that Alexander uh, Isayevich Solzhenitsyn stood above them in both vision and support. No matter where he went, Alexander, a man of humble orange, uh, origins, was congratulated on his achievements. In truth, he had achieved much in his leadership of the NTS, assumed upon the rapid departure of his predecessor to the Komi Republic following one too many failed gambits. Okay. So Bidalikov does get a mention, but he doesn't get ma named, but that's, I assume that's who they're talking about, Bidalikov. The rapid. So Bidalikov is in Komi. Why doesn't Bidalikov have a path then? Because he already effectively has one. Solidarism. But he just he doesn't have his own. It's not, It doesn't have his face on it. I haven't seen Bidalikov be mentioned anywhere in Komi. Let me know if I'm wrong. Let me know if Bidalikov gets any fucking mention in the New Order that you know of. That's interesting. I I, I don't believe Georgievich gets a, gets a mention either. I, I still haven't looked up his name. I <laughs> won't lie. But yeah, that's interesting. Alrighty then. Um, today, however, he was addressing a party conference, and as he stepped up to the podium, his audience waited for their charismatic leader to speak, but even they did not expect him to speak so clearly about the future and eventual goal of the party as a whole. He spoke about the many myriad flaws of the Red Regime, he spoke about the many myriad flaws of the old empire, and then at last he spoke about a vision for the future, about a Russia reborn built upon a strong foundation of nationalist pride and military strength, striking out to reclaim all of her constituent lands. By the time he was finished, all in attendance himself included could not uh, but be certain that Russia would inevitably return to glory once more, and that the NTS, under Solzhenitsyn, would lead that charge. The path to reclamation is difficult. Indeed it is. It's a hard path, but it's a, it's a path worth walking. Now, an economic graveyard gets went from Berlin with love. Across all of Western Russia, regular bombing missions by the German Luftwaffe make it impossible to maintain any, an economy of any reasonable size of complexity. Anything resembling a factory is identified. How, how are we running Izhevsk, then? Because that's a big factory. Must be well camouflaged. Uh, targeted and destroyed. This is by design. The Germans know that if they can keep us from industrializing, they can keep us from unifying against them. We may not be able to build an industrial pay, uh, base at the moment. 
but that does not mean we must remain uh, idle. We can evaluate our resources, identify skilled workers, and plan future development sites. We can prepare as much as we are able here to re reclaim Russia for the Romanov dynasty. We must have industry. One day the bombings will must stop, and when they do, we will be ready. Oh, the modern bogat here. We shall be seeing him in this playthrough. He'll finally find peace. A sage. Again, if anyone would like to see a playthrough of uh, Vyatka, the, the sovereignty of Western Russia and the Russian Empire as Vasily Shulgin's VNS, there is already one on the channel. Go have a look. It was a good series. Now, the sage placing the finishing touches on a document of Vasily... Uh, Vitaleyevich, Vitaleyevich, yeah, that's better. Vitaleyevich Shulgin looked out the window of his office and watched people walking and cars traversing the city center of Vyatka. He intended for the proclamation he had just finished to, to be read by all of the people of the principality, and potentially also by those elsewhere in Russia, and so it had it had to be perfect. So few still alive remember the times of the old Romanovs having succumbed to age, Bukharin's red propaganda, or the violence and war that had consumed Russia, and Shulgin believed it was his duty, his purpose, to spread that knowledge once again. In his mind, if he could do so, if he could show the people an alternative to instability and strife and a pathway to greatness, he could help promote um, oh, what does that say is that is that the principalities oh spare his successor he could help promote the eventual restoration of the Tsar's authority over all of Russia after hours of review Shulgin inspected the, uh, his document one final time a proud declaration of the resilience of the Russian people and the glory of monarchism it would no doubt bolster the morale of the principality citizens Shulgin was no propagandist but he well understood that in hard times the people needed to be reminded of both the dedication of, of their Tsar to them but why is it that that, that, that it, it was Vyatka that was chosen um, exactly like there doesn't seem to be many red partisans around the place like the monarchy is not popular also like, why are we so far east? Why aren't we in Ta Why aren't we in Tatarstan or Vologda or, or something like that? You know, it, it it doesn't make much sense for us to be this far deep, like like this far east, this deep. It's, just, it's weird. Um. Uh, Shulgin was no propagandist, but he well understood that in hard times the people needs to be reminded of both the dedication of their Tsar to them and the similar dedication expected from them in return. Shulgin believed with every fibre of his being that the only thing that could save Russia was a return to the empire that he had once lived in and to the strong central authority of the Tsar with deep respect. He signed the document and left it on his desk. He would send it to the printing shop tomorrow. Return to the ways of old. But not, kind of. He is the most old-fashioned type, but he does very much recognise the flaws of absolute monarchy. Go watch the play. It was a good one. If you haven't already. Every dog has its day. Nice, the dog didn't die. Good. I think the events are dog doesn't die, dog dies, dog gets its ear blown off by a bomb, dog just. Not too sure about that last one. From Berlin with love, just like everywhere else in Western Russia, the German Luftwaffe regularly flies over the Principality to dispense terror, misery and death from on high. They bomb everything they see and nothing escapes their efforts, not schools, hospitals, factories, houses and farms, or anything that can be considered to have economic, military or social value has escaped them. For 20 years this has continued shaping the thoughts and practices of an entire generation, and utterly destroying any possibility of a real industrial base in our or anyone else's territory. We cannot stop them, but that does not mean we must remain idle. We can investigate alternative economic methods, plan for future expansions and lay the groundwork for rapid development within. Or for rapid development when, not if the bombers stop. The resources of the realm are not infinite, even if it may seem that way to many of our citizens. And when the day comes that our skies are once again clear, we will be ready. One day the bombs will stop, one day. Political power minus 25, gain based ability minus 5%. Yikes. Is that so that should not be higher? Maybe we were missing some. Hmm. Alright. Alright, what is decreasing? Our industrial expertise, okay. And our academic base, alright, let's get working on our academic base, building schools, please. Our academic base will begin to improve, slightly increases education and leads only policy effectiveness. We have to get to building stock in one school. Nice, we need schools. Broken wing. 
On a moonlit and moonlit winter morning, the sky shook with a roar over a hundred engines. It was not an uncommon thing in the Russian anarchy to hear planes overhead, but they usually heralded the arrival of Luftwaffe bombers hell bent on, dest on destruction. The sirens would sound, civilians would seek shelter, and the soldiers would fire their rifles to try and scare the enemy away. Once the Germans had had their fun, the damage was surveyed. Factories would be repaired, the dead would be mourned, and life would carry on, but not today. Today was a day of clear skies and a contented people. The planes of the Imperial Air Force soared overhead, smoke trailing behind them as they crossed in the air. Every maneuver met with a series of gasps and applause by the audience below. The displays had been planned in the Tsar's honor, a show of the nascent Air Force's strength, but it also served as a rare entertainment for the people of Yatka. All non vital workers were permitted to attend at no cost, although the nation had certainly given up a large share of fuel. Oh, good, we won. Oh, or maybe not. Hopefully, we'll win. I think this is RNG anyway. Um, uh, where was I? Had certainly given up a large share of fuel and spare parts for the event. Unfortunately for the man of the hour, the air show was a nerve-wracking experience. Tsar Vladimir was proud of the fleet of planes at his command, one of the largest in Russia, but he was under no illusions as to the reality of the situation. Shoddy pre-conflict fighters were piloted by undertrained airmen that seemed only seconds away from crashing into another one at any given time. It was a miracle that they had managed to get so many planes in the air without a disaster. Still, even as Vladimir's fingers dug into the arm of the chair, he could not deny the beauty he saw in their potential. Maybe with the right funding and training, this meagre convocation of eagles could learn to rule the skies. Or... Uh, never mind, never mind. A broken wing can be mended. Air experience plus five. Pretty sure we've got a larger air force than the free aviators do. <laughs> you know? We've got a decent sized air force. Yeah. Yeah. How many have you got? Also, what a weird place to be having an airbase. Yeah, we literally have more aircraft than you do. Assuming that intelligence is correct. No. Imperial austerity gets about imperial austerity following an exhaustive audit of the principality's economy in its entirety. Both the Tsar and his ministers have been shocked to learn of its true, highly decrepit state. Factories lie abandoned as artisans produce what little they can in basement workshops. Fields lie fallow as farmers focus on subsistence farming to feed themselves and their families. If action is not taken, our fragile economy will soon collapse entirely. To address this, a plan for austerity has been put before the Tsar. Severe cuts to services, education and security will be painful, especially for the many already suffering, but they are necessary. And the Tsar has been very clear. They will not last forever. No, they won't. That's a fact. Now, Hill 483. Ever since the return of Tsar Vladimir to Russia alongside the German military response in the West Russian conflict, he has unsurprisingly faced accusations that neither he nor his military has sufficiently distanced themselves from the forces of the realm, with many of our officers carrying German equipment and having uh, received German training. We have long looked for an opportunity to demonstrate our separation from the German regime. While we hesitate to call it fortunate once uh, such an opportunity has presented itself, our commanders have received reports that a small hilltop community near Rezevsk has been attacked by a group displaying common Natsok symbols. Although it is unknown whether they are a German raiding party or merely bandits from the fanatics of Permit, it is known that they are currently besieging the settlement and that it cannot hold out for long. In response, the Tsar's ordered a small task force, 300 strong and equipped with heavy weaponry. He'd uh, be dispatched to break the siege of the settlement, marked on military maps as Hill 483. I'm doing, or in doing so, not only will the Tsar protect his people, but he would also prove that neither he nor his military have any remaining sympathy to Natsakism or the odious individuals who practice it. First step on a great journey. Hopefully, it doesn't fuck it up. Now. Imperial austerity. With the lamentable state of the current economy, the Tsar's advisors are united in the opinion that a program of austerity must be implemented immediately in order to Im prevent immediate total collapse. There is quite simply no, mon no money to spend, and in order to obtain capital for investment and development, cuts to other sectors must be made. The only question is how severe the implementation of this austerity should be. The majority of advisors have suggested moderation in applying significant yet reasonable cuts to various public services, including education and healthcare. Some, however, have advised Tsar that drastic times require drastic measures and that the only way to ensure success is to enforce extreme reductions in the budgets of every government service, accepting only the military and specially identified initiatives. Cuts of any kind will not be well received by the populace, and so the Tsar must decide how much hardship he believes his subject, subjects will be willing to face. All right, let me, let me quickly look at this. It's been a long time since I've seen this. Increases economic strength by a small amount, some amount. Popular support by some amount. Decreases maximum investment. We got 125 million. You don't get any liquid reserves here, why not? That sucks. GP growth will increase by 0.5. Public works projects, industrial expertise improves. We get infrastructure. GDP growth will increase by 1.5%. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's quite strong for the rest of the game. Yeah. 
No one ever spent their way out, out of a deficit, so yes. And this is what I chose um, as the VNS as well. An extreme program of austerity is our only choice. I honestly like the bonuses here to more. But lower roleplay. Now, more extreme measures will increase economic strength by. Oh, yes! Hill 483, because we lost in, in, Shul in Shulgin's run. Hill 483 success. Uh, okay. The special task force dispatched by the Tsar um, engaged the attacking raiders on the slopes of Hill 483 following initial scouting action. Although the raiders were apparently aware of their own numerical inferiority, they committed themselves to holding their position, trusting in both the terrain as well as their own rough fortifications. They clearly did not expect our forces to have brought artillery. Trapped between our soldiers and the community militia they had besieged, uh, those raiders not eliminated by artillery fell quickly to gunfire from either the front or rear, and survivors quickly surrendered. Although a small action, our men received a hero's welcome from the community, demonstrated their competence and professionalism, and showed both their own as well as the Tsar's willingness to direct, directly confront Natsakism in defense of the people. A wonderful outcome, indeed it is. We will increase popular support by a small amount. We get 5 army experience, 25 political power, and increases military training, basic training, policy effectiveness. Fantastic. Popular support for Vladimir is low. Economic strength is low. That's a lot of political power. Is there... I believe there's a national spirit regarding that. I so. yeah. Now an imperial donation. As a result of the chaotic and violent nature that dominates Western Russia, the people are quick to repeat and embellish the stories and achievements of the of those considered legends. One group are consider, so considered as that of the Free Aviators, former Red Air Force pilots who, from their airfields in the frigid north... Now... Yeah, yeah, why is their airbase up here? It couldn't... They couldn't have picked any worse of a place. Like... The range, you know, I know you. I know they've modified them. I think they've modified the biplanes with jet engines, but or uh, the, the monoplanes rather with jet, with jet engines. Now, <clears throat> rise to engage the German tar bombers whenever and where, wherever they can, they can, including over our territory. Although they are Reds, they are unlike many of their ideological brethren, fighting selflessly to protect both Russia and Russians from foreign invaders. As such, in an attempt to boost his public perception, secure additional legitimacy, and support these brave pilots the Tsar has at personal expense, secured a number of previously decommissioned aircraft as well as a large number of replacement parts for both of them. He will dispatch all of his free of charge to the free aviators, and then doing so, um, help them fight for the nation he one day intends to rule in its entirety. It'd be cool if, if the free aviators got a path and they ended up being the only nation that we could unify with in West Siberia. We will increase popular support by a small amount. We will spend 10 million. And the free aiders will get event an imperial donation. And they get also 10 million. But no actual aircraft. Huh. Weird. You could probably you could probably buy a lot of monoplane World War II fighters with 10 million 1962 US dollars. Maybe. Maybe. Let's find out. Cost of a Yak-3. Damn, 395,000. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, 395,000 US dollars. Okay, now let's do uh, 1962 USD. Uh, to today. Give me conversion, I want to enter values. Conversion. Oh, God damn it, whatever. Fine. Either way, I think we can buy a lot of aircraft. Now, a day in the life of Yakov Rifkin. Reminds me of the um, day in the life of Ivan Denisovich. I've actually read that book. It's a good book. Probably only, it was the only one of the soldiers in this book that the books that I've read. Carefully, gingerly, Yakov Rivkin placed the two candles into metal candlesticks and sold his treasured inheritances from his father. In 20 minutes, the sun would set, work would cease, and the Sabbath would begin. Striking a match, he moved to light them, the warmth in his hands reminding him of his wife and family, as well as feelings about them that he had thought long forgotten. As the candles took the light, and as the sun began to set, shadows began to dance around the room. The two points of light in front of him became blazing towers, calling him to prayer before the eyes of the Lord. And before the day of rest began, blessed are you, Lord our God, he began drawing his breath deep and closing his eyes. King of the universe, who has sanctified us... 
with his commandments and commanded us to light the Sabbath candles. The Sabbath began or had begun, but Yaakov did not open his eyes. He thought of the Jews of the world, so many stolen away. He thought of his wife and children turned to ash, and as he began his final blessing, he could not stop the tears from rolling down his cheeks. A silent prayer against the din of the world. More extreme measures. We will increase economic strength by some amount. We will decrease popular support by some amount. Political power plus 50. Our GDP growth will increase by 1%. <laughs> Yikes. Uh, that's not good. Decreases education elite only policy effectiveness. Decreases healthcare emergency support uh, policy effectiveness. The Tsar and his government are in agreement that a program of austerity is necessary in order to prevent economic collapse. But consideration must also be given to the effect that it will have on our people who have already suffered. Who have already suffered. Uh, da, 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 da. Suffered years of uh, who, who have already endured years of suffering. The decision on the severity of the austerity measures has been made by the Tsar, and he has made that hard choice. Infrastructure, healthcare, social programs, uh, and more will be cut to the bone in order to establish the state's financial security and provide a basis for our future designs of territorial reclamation. The people will not be happy, but in time they will learn that the Tsar is planning for their future just as much as his own. Oh, now we've been given political power. Good. Give me Soviet power grids. Get this fucking industry pumping. Now the attack. Hearing the exclamation from behind. Oh yes, I remember this is a big thing. Yakov Rivkin thought he knew what was about to happen. The men of the Russian Protective Corps, an anti-Semitic band of thugs masquerading as a monarchist militia, had taken to harassing him on the street. Lots of events. Uh... Aware of his heritage, they would insult him, uh, block his way, and most generally act in whichever fa uh, fashion caused him the most trouble. But today was to be much different, much worse. As they moved to surround him, he moved to walk away. But for the first time, one of them grabbed his shoulder tightly. By the time he let go, Yakov was surrounded. And then the insults began, and Yakov grew scared. That time, they not only came faster, but were also more screamed than spoken. One of the men, a well-known sign of an uptown family that was close to the Tsar, withdrew a strip of bacon from his pocket and offered it to Yakov, only to watch him shake his head in reply. Another of the thugs laughed at Boris. He began speaking to the sign. I think the dirty small hat doesn't value your generosity. Before Yakov could speak, um, could try to deny the man's words, Boris had pulled a club from his belt and swung as Yakov fell to the ground. Clutching his head in pain, the rest of the men withdrew their own clubs and began swinging as well. When they had finished and begun searching his body for gold, rubles or other valuables, Yakov was unconscious. Those on the streets did not intervene, scared of the influence of Boris's family. But from a discreet corner, however, a camera captured the scene and the faces of the perpetrators in monochrome to be sure, but also in clear definition. There will be a reckoning. No, there fucking won't be. This is monarchist Russia. No one gives a fuck what happens to small hats, let alone one small hat. They, 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 we're talking about the guys who had pogroms. No one gives a fuck. <sighs> now, from distant shores, as the small transport ship pulled into a Persian harbour, oh, I love, I love this event, none took notice of the grey-haired and bewhiskered old man who had paid the $15 necessary for passage but not the 20 necessary for a cabin. If they had, they might have noticed both a fire in his eyes and a surprisingly muscular figure that his somewhat tattered clothes could not entirely conceal. Nikolai Rumiantsev was a man destined was a man destined from birth to be a soldier. Born in the days of the old Russian Empire, he had seen the corruption and rot present in his homeland and, and could not accept it. Unable to stomach the army of his country, but still willing to fight, he had therefore joined the French Foreign Legion, uh, Legion, marching from one desert fort to another, making friends and enemies alike. He in time saw France as his new home and did not ever think he would return to Russia. But the war changed everything. With German victory came a malaise in the Legion. And once... Oh, yeah, yeah. What, what's the foreign, French Foreign Legion doing now? And once more, Rumiantsev eventually found himself uh, adrift. Uh, yeah, he had considered finding some other small war to die in, but defeat had awakened something long forgotten. Ah, fuck! Ah, God damn it. I didn't intend for that to... You know... Now, let us try that again. Uh, there will be a reckoning. Is this the... Here it is. Better eye on it this time. No, was I? He was a soldier, yes, but he was also a Russian. When word, when word reached him of Tsar Vladimir's return and the establishment of a monarch state in Russia dedicated to fighting uh, Reds and Bundle of Sticks alike, he realized eventually that he had to return to the land of his birth, find his Tsar, and serve him in one last war. Regardless of the outcome, he would die as he had lived fighting. An old man's a last hope. Nikolai Rumiantsev. Oh, no, that wasn't the bodyguard event. I assume it isn't. Rumiantsev. There he is. Nikolai Rumiantsev. Level 3. Good attack skill. Until the next sunrise, the stranger came with the sunrise. He limped. Ah, oh, yes, here, here, here is the the bogatir. 
He limped into town, blood tra trailing him from the forest around the village. Sophia had been walking to the market at the time, and she was the first to see him as he stumbled into town. Before he got far, he had slumped to the ground with a deep sigh. As she approached the man, she could see his uniform was stained with blood. His breathing was shallow, and his eyes had glazed over. In near panic, she called for her for the village doctor. The young widow brought the man into her home and set him on the couch. The doctor was able to bind the, man the man's wounds, but it would take some weeks yet for him to recover. Sophia volunteered to care for the man as he recovered. For the first two days, the stranger remained unconscious, only occasionally calling out in a foreign tongue. Uh, Sophia knew what it was at once. The tongue of the German was unmistakable. Despite the hatred she felt in her heart for the German, she continued to care for him. On the third day, he finally awoke. He had awoken in a panic. Though it only lasted a moment, the man looked into her eyes and spoke in broken Russian his thanks. Over the next week, he recovered enough to help her around the house. Each day, he would greet her with a smile on his face uh, before the beginning of the day's chores. Every evening after dinner, she would uh, change his bandages and they would talk long into the night. Eventually, he had recovered and made known his intent... Uh, to continue his trek east in Siberia. On the morning that he was to leave, she made uh, she met him outside the spare bedroom for the longest moment. Neither said a word. Finally, he leaned in and a kiss was shared between the two lost souls. The moment passed all too quickly and he left the small house in her nameless village. However, unlike so many other times in his life, the stranger left with a promise that he would r uh, return someday at the next sunrise. A promise made to be kept indeed. It is. Now... Imperial response. Tsar Vladimir sat in stunned silence as Boris Mejeev, the son of one of his senior councillors, recounted his actions. A publication of a photo showing him along with several others brutally beating one of his small hat subjects had spread like wildfire and while the Tsar had always known the young man to be an idiot, he had not previously known him to be a virulent anti-Semite. The connection between the young man's father and himself was being spoken about more and more and Vladimir knew he had to take action and quickly. When he said as much, the young man's eyes went wide. Sorry, he began voice trembling. I know I have caused you both injury and concern, but I beg you to grant mercy, if not for my sake, then for my father's who fought with you all the way from Brittany to your palace here. He swung an arm towards the window. Our family has always been supportive of the crown, and if you grant mercy, I pledge that my father and I after him will always be indebted to you, regardless of need. Please, Majesty, do not let the matter of one small hat undo all that we have done for you. Vladimir considered his words for a long moment. He had to show contrition for the injured man, of course. Uh, blah, 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 blah. But Mzeev's family was influential, and to make enemies of them after so many years of loyalty could inspire others to ask if their own long loyalties would be similarly treated so poorly. After a moment he spoke, fine, I will be merciful. This time it will not happen again, and now you may leave. We are busy... Uh Falling over himself with gratitude, Mejev rapidly retreated as the Tsar called for a secretary to compose a letter to the injured man. He hoped it would be enough. But is it enough? Now. Yes, we will scavenge for loot. A lot of events. Now we'll read this one first. I focus. D uh, divert funds to the military. I didn't miss one, did I? No, I did not. Good. Our industrial equipment will begin to improve. This will decrease popular support by some amount. Increases military training, basic training, policy effectiveness. Slightly increases maximum investment in army funding. Though painful or severe cuts to the state budget have resulted in a surplus of assignable funds. Dedicating them to the military is an obvious choice. Without a secure control of our lands, we cannot accomplish anything of note. Additional resources will allow them to recruit more soldiers, acquire more equipment, and improve the readiness. This is about to run out. It's not good. We do, however, expect a negative response from the public, given that, uh, that given what they have had to surrender in order to make this military expansion a possibility. Nevertheless, we are committed regardless of the unpopularity of this action. We are preparing for the future of all of Russia, and in time the public will understand. <clears throat> oh, excuse me. God, I better not start hiccuping. Fucking hiccups. Such a pain in the ass. Now let's get uh, Leib de Vardia. Ooh, 39,000 men into training. Now, the court tongue. As the Tsar solidifies his control and moves to codify court procedures and expectations, the issue of language has suddenly arisen. Though ethnic Russians, of course, dominate the lands that we control, Russia as a whole encompasses many more ethnic groups and languages besides. As a result, a question regarding the official language of the court has been raised. Many are surprised that such a question, I was about to say, yeah, is even being entertained. Firmly believing that Russia is a nation for Russians and, and that since Russian uh, is the uh, majority language of the court regardless, it is inherently its official language. Other courtiers, primarily those younger, more liberal-minded, there, there is no liberal minded this is the ROVS there, these people do not exist no Believing, I believe that to codify Russian as the sole language would be a step backwards in our attempts to modify the imperial system for the modern age both arguments have merit and exactly what the Tsar's decision is going to be is therefore a topic of great debate don't tell me that the soldier that the NTS wants I was going to say yeah Russia speaks Russian, and so shall the court. Political power plus 25 increases minority rights, illegal inequality, policy effectiveness. Is that only increasing? Should that be swapped? Does this only increase the, the, the rights of minorities because they have illegal inequality? That seems weird. Yes, Russia speaks Russian, and so shall the court. 
I, lo I love how they just casually make one just way better than the other. 5% base ability buys is real. Now, protests in Vietka. From the desk in his study, Tsar Vladimir could hear the crowds outside, calling for a strong response to the attack on Yakov Rivkin. Again, this would not happen. Though they had remained peaceful and there had been no reports of disorder from the guards watching them, he wished they would go away. He didn't think his migraine would stop until they did. Opening a desk door, he quickly uh, he withdrew another pain uh, another pain killer from it, um, swallowing the pill quickly. Knock on the door. A moment later, refocused his attention. He called the visitor to enter. Roman Gula, the leader of the reformers, stepped inside. A moment later, yes, the Tsar asked. Unable to hide the exhaustion from his voice, does the council need something? Gule shook his head. No, sir, not currently. He smiled and spread his hands. They just asked me to check on you. We all know how difficult this is. A flash of embarrassment across the minister's face. I want to say that we are all confident you did the best you could in an unexpected situation. In the rush, I remember from childhood, nobody would have even considered protesting for the rights of a small hat. I was going to say, yeah, like, like <laughs> it shouldn't be happening. This is weird. Uh, times are different now. No. The Tsar replied sharply, clearly. Uh, Gule nodded. Yes, sir, they are. And for the better, I would say, even if things could have perhaps been handled better at the start, I, we, know that you will do the right thing. Gule opened the door again and with a quick bow, stepped outside, leaving the Tsar with his thoughts, the sound of the crowd outside and his migraine would not stop pounding. He opened the door again and withdrew another painkiller. How does an emperor do the right thing? Also, the ROVS is here, the All-Russian Military Union. The D-O, ROVS. Uh, oh. Oh, no, that, that's, that's Kaiser Redux. Never mind. Um, but yeah, basically the eastern branch of the ROVS is here. But the All-Russian Imperial Union Order is not here, from what I'm aware of. Yeah. Oh, what's that? Oh, 152mm artillery. Lovely. Boop, boop, beep, boop. Improved computing machine. Increased taxes. Did I read the previous one? I did. Now, this will decrease popular support by some amount. This will increase economic strength by some amount. Slightly increases income taxation and elite tax exemptions policy effectiveness. Our income tax will increase by 10%. Despite our harsh austerity measures, we have not uh, reduced expenditures to a sufficient degree. Revenue must therefore increase, and the only only appreciable way to do that is through significant increases in taxation levies. Oh, cut the subsidies, bump up the taxation. Levies on a wide basket of basic and consumer goods should be sufficient, and though it will cause further public discontent, there is currently no other choice available. It is, however, believed that this measure should be the last required in order to obtain the funds needed for significant public investments, which would then permit the relaxation of austerity programs. We will show our citizens that their anger has been misplaced. Oh, yeah, sure. But they must endure for a little while longer. Fifty political power I just spent. That was not worth it. That wasn't worth it. That was not worth it. Now here we are. Luckily, we did not do it. Good. But what we do need to do is bump up our consumer goods production, our consumer goods consumption, rather. One click, and yeah, we don't have enough for two clicks. All right, but that'll help our GDP growth somewhat. The Emperor's collaboration. I, I can't believe that this is a is a hidden thing. This should not be a secret. Emperor found his collaborator. Investigating further the circumstances surrounding the assault of Yakov Rivkin, the continued lack of... Oh, never mind. This is for this stuff. I thought it was for the Germans. For Boris Mazeev, the Vyatka Tribune... Um, and the continued lack of punishment for Boris Mazeev. The Vyatka Tribune has discovered... Oh, yes, it is a thing. Has discovered shocking levels of past and potentially present collaboration with the German realm at the highest level. It is no secret that Tsar Vladimir III ruled the principality and claimed to the Russian throne. Assisted the forces of the realm during the West Russian conflict. He has claimed, however, that such assistance was not wholly voluntary in his part. Documents obtained by the Tribune make it clear that such claims are false. Copies of messages passed between the Tsar and the German representatives in Brittany. The Tsar's former residence during his years of exile detailed the story of an ambitious monarch willing to compromise both his ideals and the security of his country in the pursuit of, uh, of personal power. Documents have been reprinted in their entirety within. Continued on page two. An avalanche builds. Yes, it, yes, it does. Decreases press rights, censored press policy effect. Is that it? No, no political power hit, no stability hit. Interesting. Damage control. 
This is a complete mess, Roman Gule said, uh, tossing the latest edition of the Viatka Tribune onto the desk in front of the assembled uh, palace functionaries and the Tsar wants it dealt with now. Years ago, Gule had worked for several Soviet and other publications and that had apparently been qualification enough for the Tsar to appoint him to run damage control. For now, he began to revoke the Tribune's credentials and respond to any inquiries about the story with a claim of slander. Some of the functionaries began to move about and then he continued to schedule interviews with their primary competitors. We need to get our side of the story out. The staff arrayed around him. Gule projected confidence, but inside his own mind, he knew there would be no victory here. The allegations were out there, damage already done, and further claims were already being made. The Tribune, along with many others, uh, many other anti-governmental publications that had coalesced around it, had begun publishing stories about the Tsar's family and other aspects of his character, uh, character about Gule himself once he was thrust into the maelstrom. He knew that eventually he would be able to stop the flow of negative press. Every newspaper required access to the government to function as anything other than a seditious newsletter, and the Tribune was no exception. They would learn that in short order, uh, but it was time, uh, but it was the time before that happened that concerned him, and the only person who could shorten that period by going straight to the source of the whole matter was the Tsar himself. Gule only hoped that he would make the right decision. At least someone is doing their job right. S slightly increases press rights, sense of press, policy effectiveness. Fantastic. Prepare raid against the Tartar Republic. Ooh, is that? No, no, no. Oh, it is a river. Yeah, it is a river. We should still be able to win. Especially if we can catch them off guard against this one division. Um, where is the thingy? Also, close this up. I do not care. I don't know why. Buying equipment from the Zatus is just weird. Uh, can I no longer do it? Oh, God. As soon as they got the loot they spent, just have to balls. A different approach. Tsar Vladimir sat at his desk and looked at the letter in front of him. The last few weeks had been a hell unending. The press, the council, the subjects, and even the few ambassadors from the principality had not let him escape. Even if for a moment, first it was the attack on Rivkin and his handling of his handling of Rzev. Then it was his it was his history in Brittany, and then it was his response to those events themselves. If it, it, if it had not been for the loyal service of Roman Gul, Vladimir did not think he would have made it through. But the councillor had shown his dedication and given him good advice. Besides, advice had now rested on his desk. He had written a personal letter to Yakov Rivkin. He had spoken of his failures, of his regrets, and he had humbly and he had humbly offered compensation while asking the man for forgiveness. It would get out and be reprinted, of course, and he would again be hounded for his attempts at mitigation, his attempts at concealment. But still, the Tsar knew in his heart that sending it was the right thing. To do. He knew that he should have done this from the start, as a migraine yet again began to develop. However, a part of him rebelled. Why should he, a Tsar and proud member of the House of Romanov, debase himself in front of a commoner? Why should he not burn this letter now and treat this matter with the same disdain that his family would have done 50 years ago? But he knew he had to make a decision. The migraine was killing him. Send the letter, because it only gets worse for us if we don't. Send that letter. In reality, no such letter would be sent. <laughs> it wouldn't have been. A, it wouldn't have been a story. Wouldn't have even made the the headlines. Um, the beating of Rivkin, that is. Okay, so okay, so we can raid someone. We can raid Comey. We'll raid Comey then. Uh, this area. But which? <laughs> A letter in the life of Yakov Rivkin. Dear Mr. Rivkin, esteemed citizen of the Empire, several weeks ago you were attacked by miscreants in the streets of our capital, an event you, you no doubt remember, with great pain and anguish, the cause of which was your ethnicity and religion. As your sovereign, we apologize in the name of our crown, as well as for the callous letters not written in our hand that we sent without serious thought. In the time we have since vacillated between denouncing the hatred that harmed you and protecting our, our own position, and we would like to apologize in the same fashion as above for the same. We also realize that our apology will likely have little, little, little meaning to you. I gotta turn the sound up, it's a great song. No. Where was I? Um Unless accompanied by action, we will therefore take it. For you and your family, we shall compensate for whatever loss was incurred by the attack. For you personally, we shall give a position that my imperial authority shall protect. For all the small hats in our empire, we shall denounce the hatred that has for so long harmed their livelihood and survival. Our trusted advisor, Roman Gule, had, had implored us since the beginning to do the right thing, a nebulous concept for a monarch who must not dwell in the morals of their actions indeed. However, I dedicate this last paragraph to you, not as your czar, but as one person to another. I do not know if you will find this letter sufficient. But if you will allow me the opportunity to, to redeem my past actions, I promise, in the presence of God, we both venerate in different ways that I will try. Signed, Vladimir Kirillovich Romanov. A semblance of justice. We will increase popular support by some amount. I mean, no, okay? If we take things back to, the, like, the most recent times, it, it, let's say in this in this war before the West Russian conflict, we'll take things back to the Russian civil conflict. Denikin literally launched pogroms because it was popular with the people. Like... You know, 
it's it, this should this should be a non-story, or, or even a story that that uh, that gets set, that gets circulated not because of. <sighs> Never mind. The start of the recovery, our property will begin to improve, gain base ability plus 10%. The light can finally be seen, although painful, the austerity measures we impose managed to prevent total collapse, and these strategic investments made are finally beginning to have an effect. Economic activity has sharply increased, and new workshops and industries have begun to appear organically. We must remain vigilant, however, expanding previously reduced pogroms. Oh, fucking hell, now it's in my head. Programs, as revenues rise and instituting reforms as needed. The road ahead to complete unification under the Tsar is and is and will be a long one but what we have uh, but, we, uh, but we have done what we can to give ourselves and our people the best our possible now uh, which okay it's in Vyatka alright fine Philogodsk oh no oh what you misled me oh, Stupid cousin. Ooh, we got some, uh, some more factories. Fantastic. <laughs> Mongolian civil conflict. Ten percent base ability. Finally, we need some. before the law, yet another matter has been raised uh, before the Tsarist court, this time concerning prerogatives as it relates to the aristocracy and the legal code. Apparently one of our aristocrats quite brutally assaulted a man suspected of carrying out uh, carrying on an affair with his wife. Although arrested at the scene, he was released shortly thereafter due to inconsistencies in the laws that applies to those with noble title. The incident has caused outrage among the people of Vyatka and has also divided the court. Reformists advocating, as always, for a more open and liberal society, strongly believe that the law should apply to everyone equally, regardless of status. Conversely, many of the older aristocrats believe that certain exemptions must be granted to the ruling class in order to maintain stability and continuity. Um, the factions cannot come to agreement and the Tsar must therefore make a decision. Oh, okay, this is the, the NTS decision. The rights of the aristocracy cannot be ignored. I'm surprised that um that this one isn't the, the Gule and Solzhenitsyn decision and that this is the Shulkin decision. This will decrease popular support by some amount. This will increase economic strength by a small amount. Um, those aren't equal, yeah. Slightly increase political parties, one party state policy effectiveness, change in popularity of authoritarian democracy, 3.5%. Gain based ability, minus 3.5%. There we are. Solzhenitsyn is now the largest party. Oh yeah, the RNSUV. Yeah. Wish they had their own path. That'd be cool. Now we shall initiate raid against the Komi Republic. Or someone else does. The Vyatka Distillery. We will increase popular support by a small amount. Our GDP growth will increase by 1%. Add Vyatka Vodka, which uh, grants factory output uh, plus 5%. Needed consumer goods minus 5%. Actually, speaking of uh, consumer goods, let us increase consumer goods consumption by 10%. One more click and that'll do it. Tribute paid, fantastic. Plus 25 political power, one loot, and uh, 59. Fantastic. We can click it again, and we'll be at the maximum level. There we are. I shall take new uh, workers, please. Because that is currently decreasing. Now, via the Vyatka Distillery. To many Russians, a stable supply of good quality vodka is considered as essential as food itself. As a result of devastation from both the conflict and the German bombing campaigns, such a product has become scarce, and there. I fucking doubt that. And therein lies an opportunity that the Tsar has proposed to exploit. Potatoes will be planted and farmed in bulk, providing food, employment, and raw materials for the spirit. Distilleries will be reclaimed and reconstituted to transform the, those materials into high quality vodka, providing yet more employment, addressing domestic demand, and supplying the state with a valuable and highly desired trade good. The revenue from selling vodka all over Russia will finance other projects and with every bottle sold one more Russian will know that their czar understands their needs yeah that's not gonna fucking happen I don't give two shits what the imperial potato act gives me I am not fucking re selling vodka it, or, or, or whichever just I fucking hate alcohol and spirits is about as bad as it gets the new rush will be a sober one it has to be it fucking has to be it's one thing the Soviets definitely had on the on the whites at least for a time. They had it during the civil conflict, and then Stalin brought it back in. It was, it was flip floppity. 
Are y'all trying to get... Yeah, good. It's good. But yeah, it's, 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 we gotta cut that fucking alcohol out. Fucking hate alcohol. And not only for its general effects, but also for the ridiculous, debilitating historical effects on the Irish nation. And the Scottish nation. Gales in general. The collapse of the Triumvirate. From these he fails. Or falls, rather. Military hunter. <laughs> Why prioritise the north? Blitz the south. Though in our Irkutsk game, I don't know what was going on, but our troops were moving so slow. Ridiculous. Selling vodka to Russians, you may as well have liquid gold. Sad but true. Apparently Russians... Like... Russians don't like per capita consume more alcohol. Oh no, no that doesn't work actually. Uh, because, because alcohol is... is is, is it's done in grams and it's 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 the pure alcohol that's measured, not just like you know, um, like if you have a liter of beer and you have a liter of wine, obviously there's more alcohol total if if you choose the wine. So yeah, that doesn't work. But apparently, um, alcohol isn't as popular among younger Russians, which I'm very much glad to hear. Or, or at least spirits and such, beers and wines are more popular. Now, personally, the idea of a man drinking wine is fucking hilarious, but <laughs> at least it's not spirits. Now. Just, just, you know, I'll, I'll read this first. The Vietka Distillery. Whilst the Emperor has tasked his advisors to devise economic strategies to kickstart our crippled economy, seeking to lead by example, the Emperor has put forward a proposal of his own to his advisors when our forces secured the city of Vietka from the Reds. One of our units stumbled upon a bandit operation in the city producing moonshine in an old distillery. Attempts to remove the bandits led, led to a firefight and their wholesale deaths, but much of the equipment and the building was left intact. With large scale industry rendered impossible due to Luftwaffe bombings, the Emperor has instructed that the distillery should be at least reopened, or last reopened, and put to work producing one of Russia's most treasured resources high quality vodka. Fuck sake. Such small-scale industry, but with a significant market across Russia, will, would provide an excellent boost to our economy. I don't mind exporting um, alcohol to foreign markets. If other nations want to be degenerates, let them. Gives us an advantage. I mean, obviously, like... Let, let's suppose for a moment that, uh, that I was in charge of Ireland. And I was deciding who to export to. I wouldn't, I wouldn't allow ex alcohol exports to the EU, because those are Europeans. want to keep the Europeans strong. As possible, but send it elsewhere. Yeah, fine. Fucking fine. More, 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 more money for us. Weaker the uh, other nations are that aren't aligned with us. <laughs> nations aligned with Ireland is uh, <laughs> not a sentence I thought I'd ever say. You know what I mean? Uh, da -da -da -da. And it will open the door to more substantial industry in our future. It will be some time before we can produce vodka and mass of a worthwhile quality, but the Emperor has authorized the necessary subsidies to and in investments to allow production to begin. All that remains is to clear up the distillery and get to work. Selling vodka to Russians, you may as well have... Mm. Well, fuck yourself. Now, let's have a look. Alternative uses are research that we can improve. Okay. What's this, Gibby? I don't know, that is better. Oh, the agriculture always gets maxed out anyway, so there's no point. Slightly increases healthcare emergency support, po emergency support policy effectiveness. Could we get 40 million? 1.5% GDP. Oh, you make it so enticing. And 250% research points is emergency. You make it enticing. Yes, you do. This is, by and large, better in er on every count. But no, we can't. I won't. I won't. Alternative uses are research facilities will begin to improve, slightly increases healthcare emergency support policy effectiveness. Izhevsk gets one hospital, one fifty percent research bonus for field health hospital and support technology. Uh, or yeah, one fifty percent research bonus for field hospital technology and one fifty percent research bonus for support technology, that's just a general one. High quality alcohol produced by state distilleries, though eminently valuable for trade, can also be used as an effective antiseptic. In Russia, where injury is a fact of life and uh, medical infrastructure is, is frequently fragile, if, if, if existent at all, this is valuable almost beyond compare. By constructing laboratories adjacent to our new distilleries, we can render some of the produced spirits into medical grade disinfectant and supply both our civilian and military hospitals with a reliable and steady supply. We can, in a similar fashion, also package some of it for export, increasing trade, generating capital, and perhaps civilizing conflict fare in Russia. Ever so slightly. I mean, yeah, we're still selling it abroad, so why doesn't this give us any GDP growth? That sucks. <sighs> Good job, you gotta. Now we shall s not scavenge for loot. No, we shall 
save our political power to get Soviet power grids once more. We've lost two productions. What the hell is that? Is it trade? Yeah, it's because of trade. Because we, yeah, of course, because we started making stuff. That makes sense. It was in Tomsk. Karim is in Tomsk. I was going to say I, you, you usually don't see that color in Tomsk. Also, um, things are kicking off in Central Asia, the Tajiks and the, uh, and the, and the Kyrgyz. The Tajiks are, after hitting Kyrgyzstanian, uh, or Kyrgyz, 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 yeah, just, I think Kyrgyz works. After hitting Kyrgyz uh, border posts, they're moving in BMPs, T-72s, all that stuff. I think it's all, it's all over the, it's all over the valley. Is, is it the, I don't want to say it's the Fergana Valley. Is it the Fergana Valley? Am I right or wrong? Oh, maybe it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, I think it's... Uh, yeah, they're always competing over it because they each have a piece of it, but I I don't think the, the fighting is currently centered around the Fergana Valley. But, yeah. Tajikistan seems to be rolling on them. Rolling them, though. Um, I, know the, I know the Russians do have a... Um, oh, what should I call it? Uh, a presence in Tajikistan, but I believe they may be withdrawing because of, because of the Russo-Ukrainian conflict. And they need to get more troops there, which is sad when you're pulling out small little garrisons. I think Russia is also trying to reconcile Turkey and Syria, just so that Russia can pull their, their men out of Syria, because they need men. I didn't even realise you started off as a... That you started off as the, as the Tajik SSR. Because eventually you, you, flip, you flip to the, the Islamic one. I can't remember the name. You're the Islamic State of Talis, but you, you get the guy with the beard and the bald head. No. Finds new markets. Perhaps the old, the emperor's old connections in Brittany will come in handy, or could come in handy. Optimizations uh, made to the Viacca distilleries in recent times have resulted in even greater production than before. We uh, simply cannot sell us all on either the domestic or local foreign markets without an unacceptable reduction in price. The solution, therefore, must lie further afield. Brittany, the Tsar's former home, has in recent years embraced an identity as a nexus of legal and extra legal trade, and this offers an opportunity. Although sales likely won't reach the same levels as, as in Russia, they will act to reduce our vast stockpiles, protect our prices, and bring in hard currency besides. Fantastic. Yeah. So obviously, we um, in in the new order in Russia, specifically, what just change? I don't think so. Particularly in Western Russia, you often have focuses that like, that you never even get remotely close to a chance to do because like 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 we we'd have um we'd have a focus to to integrate uh, Tatarstan, but like Samara will knock them out. You know, it's kind of weird. But I do try to intend to do all of those focuses so that um so that we can boost the nts as much as possible i've also got already got a nice little lead let's increase that even more Ooh, AK 47s. Is that? It's kind of early. And the way we have no death, that's good. Yes, it's good working on um, this. Uh, maybe there's one. Ooh, another raid against Komi. Do not mind if I do.
Oh, the old guard, yes. It, this is the one. This is the one that I thought that, that I thought Rumi Ansett's event earlier was. Now, I'll slightly turn down this event. Or, okay, music. Oh, yeah, I'm tired. The Tsar awoke to a knock on his door. Vladimir had come to expect early morning interruptions. He could not recall once having a full night's sleep since establishing his fledging empire in Vyaka. There was always some matter or another that required his attention. The Luftwaffe's terror bombings were a threat that, uh, that they could not yet contest. And though the men of the Imperial Army watched the borders, it was all too often that they bled for it. That, that was not even to mention Vyatka's internal issues. From endless bickering about the monarchy's future role to a shattered economy, the keys of power had to be carefully managed. So it was that in spite of a tortuous migraine, the Tsar threw off his covers, dressed, and answered the door. Your Majesty, he, uh, the flustered guards, and said, I beg your pardon for the interruption, but there was a man outside demanding a personal audience. He refuses to leave, but uh, he will not see reason. Vladimir frowned. Such strong will petitioners were not unheard of, but they usually saw reason at the end of a rifle if they did not relent. Now let's see what this uh, skirmish is. Vyatka against Vilogodsk. Vilogodsk, yeah, fantastic. Either way, launch it. Now. Uh, where was I? Uh, with his own life, uh, were his own lifeguards afraid of a single persistent agitator? And why have you not made him leave? The Tsar asked with poorly concealed annoyance. Your Majesty, the man claims he was a member of your cousin's Imperial Guard. That gave him pause. Uh, such survivors were few and far between. Those that had not defected to the Reds had fought them in the bloody aftermath of their revolution. Many had uh, started new lives, of, uh, new lives as emigres. More had died if this man was who he said he was. What did he seek? Oh, fantastic. They paid up again. 25 political power, one loot, and 59 million. Thank you very much, my friend. Uh... Can we reconnect more Soviet power grids? Not yet. All right, fine. Let him in. I will speak to this man. You do well. Rolling on the river. That's a good song. Well, might, yeah, that might not be the name of the song, but it's a good part of the song. We will... Uh, oh, okay. Never mind. <clears throat> An audience with a, uh, with a ghost. Stepan Alexandrovich Novikov had not been with Tsar Vladimir expected. He was a weathered remnant of the past, le uh, leaning on a long defunct rifle to support his weight. He was missing two fingers on his left hand and another on his right. His beard was grey and comically uneven, as if he had tried to groom it for his audience. Most quaint of all, the old man was quite talkative, as trait not often sought in guards nor appreciated in the presence of emperors. Since introducing himself, he had hardly paused to breathe. Stepan spoke with his pride at being selected for, his, for Tsar Nikolai II's Imperial Guard. He spoke of his disgust as hundreds of his compatriots abandoned their monarch in the face of the revolution. Fun fact, uh, Nikolai II sent... Uh, if you ever want to learn a lot about Russian history, I suggest you go to Quora and search, search up a man named Dima Vorobiev. He writes some great answers. But um, I learned recently that uh, Nikolai II sent a lot of his lifeguard regiments uh, to the Carpathians in western Ukraine in 1915, and he lost a lot of men there. Um, that could have been very helpful uh, when the uh, revolution started kicking off. He spoke of his relief that he might fight for the Tsar again in the White Army, then of a sorrow at their bitter defeat. He spoke of his refusal to serve the Union and, uh, and his time as an emigre in France. He spoke of his return to Russia when France fell. He spoke of long years spent in a motherland that no longer felt like his own, watching it be torn apart by a pre first by oppression and second by invasion. Uh, he spoke of the thousands of men and women he saw die for a regime that did not value them. He spoke of war and slaughter and collapse, of a shattered Russian need of hope. He spoke of trying to join the monarchists in the West Russian conflict, only to be captured by Soviets. Before he could, he spoke of imprisonment and hard labour and torture. He spoke of the daring escape that nearly cost him his life and his journey to Vyatka. He spoke until Vladimir interrupted him. Um, what is it that you would ask of us? Stepan, finally, pause to take a breath. Your Majesty, I would serve in your lifeguard. And power plus one. We'll be here for that. Spoilers. Advanced computing machine. Fantastic. Uh, yeah, that's all fine. Now, rolling on the river, we'll increase economic strength by a small... Oh, they, they turned us down. Huh. Very well. Why does that decrease our economic strength by some amount? It, our economic strength shouldn't be decreased. We just shouldn't get any buffs. That's stupid. That is stupid. I hate that. Oh, I'm going to fix that. I disagree. I disagree. How much is this? By some amount. All right. Which is the... Alright then. PP 150. We'll increase economic strength by a small amount. We will get 30 million. I'm going to do that again as soon as it pops back up as well. I don't like that. I don't like that at all. 
now. Uneasy lies the crown as had become distressingly common. Tsar Vladimir walked with terrible pounding in his skull. Reaching over to the battle of painkillers, his use of which had become all too regular, he swallowed one and felt the pain subside. For now, everything seemed to cause the migraines these days. Council meetings that ended in shouting matches between his advisors, reports of military discontent and confusion. Even perhaps the Tsar thought punishment from God for his many sins. He wasn't even free from them while sleeping anymore. When he had first marched, in, marched into Vyatka all those years ago, he had not, imag not have imagined why the th uh, that things would be this way. He had grown on stories about the wonders of the monarchy and the power of the Tsar. He now knew them to be lies. His government was divided, his army was paralyzed, and his people were, were deprived, and very often he felt as if he had no power at all. An observer along for the ride, but these uh, those stories of glory and power had always been accompanied by very serious talks of duty. He had a duty to his people and to Russia. Uh, I wish he had a mustache. And those people simply could not be and, and those uh, could, and those simply could not be abandoned, no matter how much he sometimes wanted to leave and return to Brittany or somewhere farther afield. He was a Tsar and he had his duty, which for now at least involved arousing from bed and preparing for the day. A noble burden indeed. <laughs> You have to get out of bed and put on your clothes. You are truly the toughest of them all. Now, an offer refused. Unfortunately, it seems the Bretons were not wise enough to accept a more than generous offer. Agents in Kostroma have reported back that their mutually beneficial offer has been politely turned down. Even after substantial concessions were made on our part, uh, cited cite cite were the risks of transporting the vodka across Europe and our questionable ability to meet demand. This is a grave mistake on Brittany's part, of course, but it seems that they have made up their mind. It seems, therefore, that our, that our distillery will have to remain focused on domestic production. Overall, this has been a major blow to our efforts to obtain foreign currency. And for the foreseeable future, it seems that we will have to continue relying on that which we receive from emigres abroad. Nevertheless, our distillery is proving to be a worthwhile investment, and all hope is not lost for trading our vodka abroad. Several of our closer neighbours could still prove to be interested in acquiring more alcoholic beverages, and as our power... I assume we went to them first. Yeah. We could easily end up doing ourselves uh, what we had to rely on the Bretons for at present. Perhaps it is better to avoid entanglements with the, entanglements with the black market. This will decrease economic strength, but somehow political purpose is 50. Yeah, that's, that's just not going to fly, lad. So we've been increasing the economic strength continually. How is it only moderate? That's annoying. Rolling on the river. We'll increase economic strength by a small amount. Our business tax will increase by 10%. Political problems 35. River transport has long been a mainstay of Russian commerce and trade. Transport along them is often much faster than moving overland. This is doubly so in current times given the state of Russian infrastructure. That's fantastic. Uh, bah, 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 bah. Uh, though we no longer control great rivers such as the Dnieper, the Don, or the Volga, we do control the Vyatka River, and it connects into a vast network of other rivers across western Russia. By reopening the city's wharves and promoting the construction of river barges and other tradecraft, we can compensate for our infrastructure and increase trade both internally and externally. Perhaps in time, Vyatka itself will become a hub for such activity. Fantastic. What song is playing at the moment? Yeah, yes, the Soviet assault walls. But alright, lads, I hope you enjoyed this first episode. If you did, please consider liking, subscribing, and commenting down below. I shall see you in the next episode where more focuses and progression towards the reunification of the Empire awaits. See you then.